Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived in harmony. Then everything changed when Netflix attacked. Hello hooligans! We have a lot to talk about today, so I'm gonna keep this intro really short. Spoiler alert for Avatar The Last Airbender Netflix edition. First of all, I really, really wanted to like this. I think unfortunately a lot of people went into this with a hater mindset already, so it kind of tainted their experience. But I try to go in as open-minded as possible. That being said, there were a lot of problems. Don't worry, there was also some good parts about it. So let's start with one of the strongest parts of the whole series, the visuals. Overall, it looked incredible. I mean, I really understand why each episode was $20 million. They did not waste their budget at all. Every single scene required some high level of VFX for them to pull off this fantasy world. Was it at the level of Game of Thrones visuals? Maybe not. And we can talk about that later considering the creators wanted this to be Game of Thrones vibe. All of the locations looked stunning. I mean, just off the top of my head, Omashu looked picture perfect. The air temples looked great, or sorry, air temple, considering they only went to one air temple. The northern water tribe, wow. Especially inside of the oasis. And the original show is like a very small room, but this was expansive. These locations were definitely top tier. Also, all the animals and creatures were really well done, especially Appa. I mean, his fur just looked so fluffy. I wanted to give Appa a big fat hug. Momo looked great. The other animals also looked great, like those little chicken horse things. Thingies, the badger moles, the sheer shoe, they all looked great. By the way, on the topic of Appa, he didn't really contribute as much as the original show, but also I can understand considering probably every scene that Appa is in is hella expensive. And then talking about Momo, my jaw almost broke off my face when I thought he died. I was like, if they're gonna kill Momo, I'm gonna stop watching this show. Sometimes they would use a 3D body double for the actors, and that was like really, really obvious whenever they would do that because the physics and just how the body moves, it just like didn't look right. So I hope they would improve upon that. I understand some of the scenes you can't use a stunt double because clearly there's these characters flying and stuff. So you can't really, you know, pull that off in real life. The entire Siege of the North sequence was incredibly well done, especially when Zhao killed the moon spirit and then everything became black and white, but then would turn into color whenever there was fire or light in the presence. I was blown away by that. Like I was honestly trying to see how they transitioned the black and white into color. That was really impressive. Now, while most of the VFX work looked great, some of the practical costumes didn't look that impressive. A lot of people are saying, you know, the show looks like cosplay, and I kind of understand where they're coming from because a lot of the colors are super saturated, which I actually think is a good thing. A lot of fantasy shows these days choose to have a really desaturated, dim, dark color palette, and sometimes it's just not visually impressive to see. Where my problem is, is just the textures of the clothing. I think why it looks so much like cosplay is because the materials clearly look like stage wear or something, they're just not high quality enough for me to believe that they're real clothing that these people would wear in that time period. Like one very clear example is the blue spirit mask. That literally looked like plastic that a cosplayer made. And that's no shade on cosplayers because cosplay is super impressive, right? But this is a different medium. This is for TV. The mask just looked too clean when in real life the mask might have like fingerprints on her or like scratches or just more detailed textures on that prop. Another example is the weapon that Sokka used. It was like a club thing. That also looked really cheap and made out of plastic. I thought his boomerang actually looked pretty good. Oh, and then another atrocious prop was Yue's wig. What was that? I cannot believe the hair and makeup department saw that wig and was like, yeah, that looks fine. And speaking of hair, a lot of the facial hair on a bunch of the characters also just looked glued on and just did not look realistic at all. So I think overall that's why it contributed to this cosplay look. But it was really, really great to see such a diverse cast. I mean, it really did feel like we were in Asia. I feel like I've been so conditioned to just expect to see white people that when I didn't see a white person, I was like waiting for them to come on screen. Like I didn't even see any white actors in the background. Let's bring back white actors. All right, now let's talk about all of the characters. First thing is first, 
let's get this out of the way across the board. I think the acting needs work. And you know, that's okay because most of these actors are new and very young actors. So of course I can't expect them to give me, you know, Oscar worthy performances, but they definitely need a lot of direction going forward because it kind of took me out of the scenes a lot of the times. Let's talk about Aang. So in this version, Aang is a lot more driven to actually fulfill his responsibility as the Avatar. He goes to Kyoshi to learn about Kyoshi instead of wanting to play around. He's not as directionless as the original. Unfortunately, dare I say, that makes him boring to watch. And the original is just so fun to watch Aang just goof off and be a kid. But here it's like them forcing it down our throats that this 12 year old has to grow up so fast. In fact, I'm pretty sure they explicitly had Aang be like, oh, I had to grow up so fast. His whole arc this season was talking about how he needs to make the tough choices to win a war. And every single character was telling him that left and right. It just made it not very fun to watch him as the lead character. Also, another thing is he has zero chemistry between him and Katara. And for that matter, barely any chemistry with Sokka. I don't mind if they're trying to save this romance arc between him and Katara for maybe future seasons, but at least establish some kind of friendship. I don't feel like the three of them are friends at all. It's not, it's not being sold to me. And I think a big part of it is because they spend so much time apart. In the show, we had quote unquote filler episodes where they're just going on these missions that don't really matter. But in the end, we still get to see them bonding over things. Here, because it's so driven and focused to the plot, we don't actually get to see them hanging out that much. In fact, Aang doesn't even learn waterbending from Katara at all. This actually was crazy. Aang did not waterbend at all until he was in the Avatar state at the very end. I could not believe it. I think a lot of people are also annoyed that Aang had to teach Katara how to waterbend. That part I don't really mind because Aang is just more experienced in terms of bending overall. So it's okay to me that Aang guided Katara in the beginning on how to just bend in general. But how it should have been is that Katara is training to be a, become a better waterbender while also trying to train Aang. And then in the process, Aang is actually better than Katara naturally. And so then Katara gets angry over that. We didn't get any of that. We didn't, ugh, it was just, that's so frustrating. You know, I wouldn't even mind it if they did like a cheesy training montage. At least we could have seen Aang and Katara training together, bonding. Okay, let's talk about when he actually does enter the Avatar state at the very end and merges with the ocean spirit. That was awesome. It was great to finally see him waterbend, even though that was the plot of the entire first season. Visually, it looked super cool, but I didn't understand why the whole time they were like, oh, there is no Avatar anymore. And they kept on saying that over and over again. I was like, are you guys trying to convince us that Aang is like dead or like his soul is lost? I just don't understand why there's such an emphasis on that because we know Aang is co coming back. He's the main character. And in terms of his avatar stay, we only got to see him go into it at the beginning in the Southern Air Temple and at the very end. We missed out on him going into the avatar state in the beginning, the first time he fought Zuko, which is really disappointing because that is technically when he waterbends for the first time. You know, he makes this giant whirlpool around him and then he floods the ship. And that's when Katara was like, wow, so that's what waterbending really looks like. But instead, Katara randomly knows how to waterbend all of a sudden and creates a wall of water to protect them. Speaking of Katara, unfortunately, she is the worst character. I think it's a combination of her writing and just the way the actress delivers her lines. I'm, I'm sorry. A lot of times she's very expressionless and she comes off as super passive. But originally Katara has a lot of attitude. She's supposed to be the younger sister, but a lot of times she behaves as if she's the older sister because she's so overprotective and motherly as Sokka describes. I think what's so great about the original Katara is that she is this girl boss, right? But she never loses her side of femininity. Her being a woman is both her strength and her weakness. I think I saw glimpses of that by the last episode when, you know, she was fighting Paku. So it gives me hope that this can get better in the future, but I, there needs to be some kind of training for her to be more expressive and just have a bigger presence on screen. I think the moment when she inspired the other female waterbenders, 
that was great, but at the same time felt a little forced to me. And one more thing about her is that she levels up really quickly without us actually seeing her train. And again, this goes back to the thing where we could have even used a little bit of a training montage. Don't get me wrong, her fight scene with Paku and Zuko were awesome. I love seeing her powerful, but I just wish there's a more gradual curve of how she got to that point. Also small detail that I wish they kept in is how Paku finds her necklace and was like, oh, is that grand grand? And then Paku kind of becomes her grandpa. I think that was a little bit of a missed opportunity. Okay, let's talk about Sokka. Obviously, the elephant in the room is that his sexism is missing, right? I agree, it's a huge part of his original arc, but I think without it, it's, it's still okay. I think his character arc is definitely more focused on what it means to be a hero versus just strictly a warrior. And I think that's a great arc, but that doesn't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive from sexism. I just think his interaction with Suki is just a little more disappointing than the original when Suki just beats his ass. And speaking of Suki, why did Suki give her fan away to Sokka? We never get to see Sokka use the fan again. Also, I'll be honest, the humor is very meh. I think he's like 70% serious and then only 30% funny. And I get it, the show wants to be more serious, but then it kind of just takes away from Sokka's appeal. And the last thing I want to mention is that he just has no chemistry with Yue, and that felt so forced. And I'll talk a little bit more about Yue later. All right, let's talk about Zuko. Loved seeing him pre-Scar days. When Iroh says, you look like a prince, and also when his crew calls him your highness, those were great moments moments because it really shows what he truly has the potential of becoming and how he really is royalty under all of this trauma on the outside. And the Agni Kai scene when he got his face burned, that was crazy, that was traumatic, and I'm really glad they showed that. Also, he came off as really bratty, and I think that's actually a good thing because he is just a teenager, and in the original show, especially the first season, Zuko did come off as like comedically bratty. I do think he's missing a bit of edge though. He just screams a lot, but he is kind of masking the lack of edginess. All right, let's talk about Uncle Iroh. He is definitely more serious like most of the characters. He makes less jokes about food and tea, which I really miss, but I will say it makes it more compelling that he used to be this, you know, warlord and someone who people actually feared. Although I do think they did take away from his spiritual side, they only threw that in at the very end. The scene where it was revealed that Lu Ten died, that was really, really well done. In the background, you could hear the leaves from the vine song and that was super emotional. Now let's talk about Azula. <sighs> I really, really don't want to dogpile on her because everyone on the internet is shitting on her. That being said, in the most delicate way possible, casting her was a mistake. I do not feel the intimidation from her. She's supposed to be this like sharp villainous figure. I just, I don't get that energy from her performance. And not only just about her performance, but the way that she's written is crazy to me. I cannot believe that she's written as not the favorite child and the fact that she's jealous of Zuko. Those are literally traits that are diametrically opposed from what Azula is supposed to be. Azula was born lucky. Zuko was lucky to be born, right? Azula has never been jealous of Zuko because she knows she's that girl. Ozai never felt the need to take her down a notch because he was like, this is my trusted daughter and I can manipulate her however I want because I'm treating her like my favorite child. The fact that they made Zuko be the motivational factor behind what she does, and honestly, I don't think she should have been in this first season. The fact that she was the mastermind behind Zhao's plans is just a total excuse to have her contribute to the plot in any kind of way. I think at the very most, we should have just seen her in the flashbacks. And then at the very last scene when she actually takes over Omashu, I think we could have just seen her there. We did not need to see her training and lightning bending. I mean, it's cool to see that, but they need to save some reveals for season two. You can't just give everything away this very first season. And what's crazier than having Azula in the season is including Mei and Ty Lee in the season. 
they are literally just Azula's props. Like the whole part about Azula recruiting Mei and Tai Li by manipulating them, that was such a great introduction of who Azula is in terms of a character. I cannot believe they took that away from us. I do think a lot of people online are being really nasty about the actors for Mei and Tai Li, and I think that's very inappropriate, but I do agree they should not have been in the season, period. And finally, let's talk about Ozai and Zhao. Both of them were great casting choices. I think they sell not only just being evil, but they also sell the warlord side of things. Especially how Zhao wants to usurp Ozai, that was a great addition. And then when Zhao says Aang doesn't even matter, ooh! Okay, now let's talk about the changes that they made to this show, because there were a lot. First off, the structure of the show where it was two episodes per element. I like that because it thematically makes a lot of sense. However, I do think it was a double-edged sword because it limited them a lot in terms of what they are willing to do. But because of this structure, I cannot believe they didn't drop two episodes per week. Like, why would you not release it weekly? You would have had the entire month for Avatar to be trending. There were just so many questionable decisions made for the show. Okay, so another change is that the water bending scroll episode was completely skipped, but they did include it at the very beginning when Grand Grand actually gave Katara the scroll. You know, that's fine. I think the water bending scroll episode is iconic, but it's definitely one of the weaker episodes. Another change is Zuko's notebook. That was such like a random addition and completely there just for exposition. He conveniently has a notebook about all of the avatars that Aang could have looked at so that he knows where to go next. And I'm not gonna get that much into it, but there's just a ton of excuses for exposition that they did not need to include. And speaking of the different avatars, Kiyoshi kind of replaces Roku in terms of being Aang's main spiritual guide. So I guess they did this so they replaced the Avatar Day episode in book two. I just don't think it makes a lot of sense for Kiyoshi to be the main one even though I love her to death. Roku is just so much more important in terms of the context of the war. Also Kiyoshi is like angry and yelling at Aang when she's supposed to be this very cold, calculated person. And this is kind of a recurring problem with all the avatars, I guess, besides Kurok. Like, did they not watch the show? Why are they acting this way? For example, Roku? Oh, hell no. Why, why is he, why is he goofy? Since when was Roku yuck, yuck, yuck? Like Roku acted more like Boomy than Boomy acted like Boomy. Not only did Roku not serve as the main spiritual guide, but also he became a total MacGuffin. He was literally included in the season so that there was this mother of faces prop to give to Aang. Absolutely ridiculous. But I guess speaking of the mother of faces, they are including some lore that is outside of the main Avatar The Last Airbender series. For example, the mother of faces is introduced in the comics. They talk about the fog of lost souls, which is talked about in Korra. So this makes me think maybe they'll explore the lore behind what happened to Zuko's mother. That would be a great addition to the show. All right, let's talk about the Omashu episode. So I've seen a lot of complaints about this episode. So essentially they combined the secret tunnel plot line with the jet plot line, with the Boomy plot line, and also the Northern Air Temple plot line, I believe. Listen, I'm happy we got to see the secret tunnel song, but the fact that they split up Aang from Sokka and Katara, that was ridiculous because the whole point of the secret tunnel episode was about the cave of two lovers and creating more romance for Aang and Katara. So I think they should have just scrapped the entire secret tunnel thing unless they just wanted to do a joke about the secret tunnel. That was a complete waste of time. It also made Boomy's trial way less meaningful because Aang didn't have to go save Katara and Sokka. Also, there was no fun parts of it, that there was no flopsy. There was no discovering who Boomy is because Aang just figured it out literally immediately. Also, Iroh getting captured by the Earthbenders, we didn't get to see the hot spring scene. So we just missed out on a lot of the fun and charming parts of the original show. But as for the combination of the jet plot line with the Northern Air Temple plot line, I actually didn't mind. I think it worked well. I think it definitely saved a lot of time. And in the end result, it was still kind of the same thing for Jet and Teo. But one problem of combining these different plot lines is that everything is in the same place. Everything happened in Omashu, so there are less places traveled in the world, therefore making this Avatar universe feel smaller. 
Now let's talk about the fact that they all go into the spirit world. So you have the audacity of splitting up Aang from Sokka and Katara, but then when Aang is supposed to be the only one who the Avatar, the bridge of the human universe and the spirit world, somehow in this moment when they are supposed to be split up, no, Sokka and Katara both are able to go into the spirit world. When I saw that, I was like, okay, okay, I'm just gonna roll with the punches, even though this is ridiculous. But then they decided to introduce every spirit that Aang meets along the three seasons in this one spirit episode. Like this episode was supposed to be focused on Heibai, right? Well, guess what? They also included Ko the Face Stealer. Okay, okay, we, maybe we could get behind that also. But then they also added Wang Shitong. Why? Why? So does this mean we're not gonna get the very iconic and very necessary library episode in book two? And not only was Wang Shitong there, his fox helpers were also there. Oh wait, turns out the fox helpers is Yue. So Yue can also go into the spirit world as a fox. Oh my God. This episode actually hurt my soul to watch. What is this like amalgamation monster of an episode with like every piece of spirit lore inside of it? At this point, I was expecting to see Rava and Vatu. <sighs> Let me bring down my blood pressure. I will say besides the whole fox spirit thing, Yue's character also changes a lot. She's no longer a damsel in distress and she's a lot more proactive and she's also a waterbender. I didn't mind these changes. It's obviously done because of a more modern lens. It didn't really change the arc of Yue anyway. Okay, now let's finally talk about these more adult changes. So obviously the creator said that they want to appeal to Game of Thrones fans, which I don't even know what that means. Well, there were a lot more deaths shown. It was definitely felt more like a war. Uh, there were less jokes and it tries to be a lot more emotional. But does that mean it's appealing to Game of Thrones fans? I don't think so. It almost feels like they're straddling the line right in the middle of trying to be this lighthearted show versus a Game of Thrones dark show, but it's right in the middle where it just doesn't necessarily work. I think a huge problem is they, they, they just need to figure out who the demographic they're trying to appeal to is. Are they trying to find a new audience to get into Avatar? Or are they trying to appeal to the OG audience who grew up with the show, who don't necessarily need a very dark version of the show, they just wanna see this lighthearted, beautiful fantasy show brought into live action. I don't know, they need to sort out their priorities there for sure. All right, so in terms of my score for this season, I'm going to have to give it a six out of 10. I mean, it is better than the movie by leaps and bounds. However, they just had too many changes that did not necessarily benefit it at all. So a mediocre start, but I, as a fan of this universe, I will definitely be watching. I think it's very important in terms of representation. I think you should all go watch it, form your own opinions. But in conclusion, I need it to get better going on. So I will also be making a video of how I would have structured this first season. So make sure y'all stay tuned for that. And also I just made a live reaction to the very first episode. And I also made a live reaction to the M. Night Shyamalan movie. So make sure you guys go check out those videos as well. And I'll very much appreciate it. Okay, bye.